So why don't we, why don't we uh, get started? Um, my name is, is Arto Vaughn. I'm the new executive director of Project SAVE. Uh, welcome to our first talk in, in our uh, series called Conversations on Photography. Um, we're very, very excited. Uh, Conversations in Photography is the first in a, in a number of new initiatives that we have going on at Project SAVE that I'm going to very quickly talk about before I introduce our, our wonderful speaker uh, for this evening, Tatiana Cole. Um, as many of you know, Project SAVE uh, has been around since 1975. Uh, so we're coming uh, close to our 50th anniversary in 2025, so it's very exciting. Um, it was founded by Ruth Tomasian, uh, our, our, the founder and president of Project SAVE. Uh, Ruth uh, has been doing incredible work uh, for the last 45 years um, to document and archive and collect uh, photos um, that reflect the Armenian global experience. Um, Ruth has just recently, in the last uh, few months, uh, she's uh, entered uh, semi-retirement after all these decades of incredible uh, pioneering work. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm honored uh, to, uh, that she's passed the torch uh, to me. Um, we are uh, also growing in terms of our staff. Uh, we have two wonderful uh, archivists, uh, Marta Fodor and Margaret Eckstein. Uh, who are just fantastic um, and who are, we're hoping to keep expanding in the next couple of years. Um, as I said, the Conversations on Photography series is our first initiative that, that we're launching. Um, and um, after uh, the uh, presentation, I'll let you know a little bit more of the, the upcoming talks that we have. Um, the next one is April 9th, by the way, so a month from now. Um, the other things we're doing is uh, a residency, uh, hopefully starting in the next month or two, uh, where we'll be inviting, uh, it might be an artist, it might be a writer, it might be a photographer, it might be a, 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 an archival, uh, an archivist or, or a different type of researcher, um, to come and spend some time uh, at Project Save, and then to, to make use of the archive in whatever manner uh, that inspires them and to create something from that that then we will share through an exhibit, through talks and so forth. So basically, uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that Project Save is a living uh, archive, uh, that uh, we are uh, expanding our reach, um, uh, uh, connecting with different demographics and reminding people not only of how important Project Save is, but how important photography is. And at the end of the day, Project Save is a photography archive. So we're very uh, interested in kind of reminding folks that um, uh, uh, although our ar archive happens to uh, uh, reflect uh, the Armenian experience uh, worldwide. Um, the the medium through which we do that is photography. So so at the end of the day, we're champions of photography um, as a universal uh, language. Um, I think I will maybe stop there. Um, if anyone's interested, as I say, with all these new initiatives, of course, all, everyone's support is is very much appreciated. Uh, Project Save has been so fortunate in these 45 years to have such wonderful uh, and enthusiastic supporters. Um, so if anyone's interested, projectsave.org is our site uh, to check out what we do. And if you'd like to uh, support us in our endeavor, we very much appreciate that. Um, let me introduce uh, Tatiana Cole, our speaker for uh, tonight that we are so excited to have is our, our, our inaugural speaker in this series. Uh, Tatiana Cole is an art conservator that specializes in research materials. She's a paper and photograph conservator for the Boston Athenaeum and has a private practice called Cole Conservation. She's worked with the collections of Harvard Art Museums, the Rose Art Museum, and the Portland Museum of Art in New England the Princeton University Art Museum as well, and MoMA, the, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and various private uh, collections and galleries and so forth. Uh, Tatiana works with vernacular and fine art photography that dates from the medium's, in, medium's invention in 1839 through today. Um, and and uh, 
finally, on, on top of all that um, wonderful uh, experience and expertise, uh, I'm very honored that uh, Tatiana is also uh, a part of our new advisory board uh, at Project Save, which is one of the first things I did uh, when I came to Project Save. We have a wonderful new, uh, very dynamic uh, advisory board, and we're very thrilled to have uh, Tatiana as, as one of the members. So I'm going to turn it over to Tatiana Cole. Thank you, Tatiana. Okay, well, first of all, I'm so pleased that so many of you were able to join us this evening for this presentation about the material nature of the photograph and the value that photographs and archives bring to our lives. One can find photographs almost anywhere. For example, they are in our personal photo archives, public archives, news archives, business archives, research institutions, libraries, and fine art collections. There are numerous photographic processes and some processes have variations to them as well. This timeline from the graphics atlas of the Image Permanence Institute is just a summary. You may recognize names such as the daguerreotype or a cyanotype or a silver gelatin print or a chromogenic or C print, which is the common color photograph. And of course the inkjet. The photographic image can be made up of different materials um, or different metals or dyes. For instance, the early salted paper print on the left, uh, there's an example here on the left, had silver image material. The, the daguerreotype shown in the middle is formed by silver mercury particles that are toned with gold. And the cyanotype image, an example shown on the right, is formed using iron-based chemistry. The platinum printing process shown here on the left utilizes iron, but ultimately forms an image that is made up of platinum. And the silver gelatin developed out process forms filamentary silver, and that relates to the shape that the silver takes ultimately um, on the paper surface to make an image. And then the SX70 instant Polaroid print on the right, also referred to as an internal dye diffusion film, utilizes silver to ultimately form a dye-based color image. Furthermore, there is a wide range of substrates, thicknesses and coatings that affect how glossy or matte and how flimsy or rigid a photograph is. What you see in the slide are cross sections of two different types of photographs, two of many. On the left is a color photograph that has a paper core with a plastic polyethylene coating on either side. And then the dye image in a gelatin emulsion on top. When I was writing this, I, I, I thought that it sounded like a multi-layered cake that you just would not want to eat. On the right is more like a wholesome cracker, though still inedible. It is a cross section of a cyanotype, which is made up of two ingredients. There is the paper support, and the iron or ferric ferrous cyanide image on top and within the superficial paper fibers. These variations in image material, substrates and coatings can suggest when a photograph was printed and by whom. Uh, was it a professional photographer, a photo lab, or perhaps a dark room at home? These variations can also give us a sense of whether an image was mass produced, what kind of financial investment it was for the owner of the print, for example. In addition to the print materials, photographs can sometimes have marks and inscriptions. This slide shows the front and back of a family portrait taken in 1892. The sitters are labeled and there is a phot photographer stamp on the back. Notes from the archive states that this portrait was taken especially to send to the son of the elders in this image. At the time, the son was working in a shoe factory in Worcester, Massachusetts. He later returned to Morenig where he married and had children before being killed in the genocide of 1915. This photograph is a composite family portrait from circa 1910, 1924, and an unknown date. The original portrait was sent to this man on the left, who was at the time living in the United States as a remembrance of his family. After the genocide, he inserted a picture of himself at an older age, that is the image of the man on the left and his father, who's the other man in a suit under the number seven, as a way of reuniting the family. Project Save has much more information pertaining to this print in their archive. 
There are other examples of photographs that were composites or expected to have additions in the future. On the left is a geographically incorrect composite image made prior to 1915, depicting the Archaeos mountain over the residential district of Finesse the Turkish government's army garrison in the top left corner and a road leading away to Elbis. This image in the middle is another composite. Upon a closer examination, one notices how the prints were taped together and then re-photographed and adhered to this more formal mount board. The portrait on the right was taken with the plan to include the father who is absent from this photo. This photograph on the left was once a photograph, a, a postcard photograph, then later cut down to be used in official papers for French legation, such as a passport, and then later turned into a precious photograph of someone's father, as it was labeled Papa. The image on the right is uh, shown on, uh, on the front and the back. Um, it, it's an image of a group of um, of a, a Yeprad teachers from 1901. It exhibits creases and breaks as one would find in a photograph that was folded and open repeatedly, perhaps to be kept in someone's pocket or a wallet, some, some place close. It was later photographed and printed on this postcard support. And you can see how the fold lines stop within uh, the border of the image. These small snapshots are from a collection of vernacular prints from the Peter Cohen collection at the Art Institute of Chicago. We do not know these people, um, but the size and tonality of the print suggests that they are from the 1940s to 60s. And they also share a common background. So with further research, one may be able to find out where these people once lived and what their community was like. These photographs are all in color but the way they have resisted fading and shifting in color offers hints to their time period, the type of photographic paper used, and perhaps even how they were stored or displayed. The image on the left is from the 1950s, but was well processed and stored. There is little to no change in the colors. The two prints in the middle are Kodachromes from the 1940s, and Kodachromes are known to be very stable, so they still show beautiful color. The print on the right is from the 1980s and it exhibits typical degradation of the cyan green color to, um, typical of chromogenic prints from that era, especially if they were exposed to too much light. And I have images like this on our fridge or my parents' fridge um, that we still love, but they have certainly changed, changed with time. Other types of photographs can give you a strong sense of their making. The cyanotype on the left by Anna Atkins is from 1844, one of the earliest processes. It was often used by botanists because of how easy it was to make a print. As with this print, what one could go out in the field with pre-sensitized paper, place a specimen such as seaweed on the paper, expose it to light, and simply wash it in water to obtain a marvelous documentation of the seaweed. On the right is a stunning example of a hand-tinted print in the collection of the Boston Athenaeum. This portrait um, of Snake Whistle, a young Cheyenne in dance costume, is from 1880. The level of detail when seen in person brings you right there to the moment when this print was being tinted to represent the beautiful adornment of the sitter. As the writer Susan Sontag wrote, to collect photographs is to collect the world. We take and collect photographs for many different reasons. Early on, the materials and methods were expensive and difficult, so photographs were taken on special occasions to celebrate the birth of a child, to document the union of two people, or to memorialize those we have lost. Photographs are taken to commemorate passage to another country and into a new life, as seen on the left. They are taken to document 50 years of marriage, including the first photograph of their union, as you can see in this image, to celebrate their lives, the lives they have shared and challenges they have overcome. The photograph on the right is a portrait of the oldest new citizen at age 117, receiving her citizenship to the United States. 
The two photographs on the left show the exhibition of photographs in our, in our living spaces to remember our ancestors and to feel close to our families and friends, perhaps when we cannot actually be together. We take pictures with pictures out of pride for new generations and continuation of family lines. The image on the right is from 1980 and taken in Truro, Massachusetts, close to where I am. It shows two generations sharing in the making of mante or dumpling, dumplings. Photographs are taken to celebrate and document the, com the completion of studies and the group that went through that experience together. The image on the left shows a graduating class of an Armenian Red Cross sponsored nursing school in Constantinople from a circa 1922. The image on the right is a family portrait showing two generations of successful textile merchants with their household servants and photographs of other family members placed at front center from 1894. Anne Tucker, curator of the 2012 exhibit titled War Photography at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston aptly described how photographs capture the atrocities, the courage, the caring, the human emotions and actions that surround war. Right now we are seeing all over the news and social media photographs of the attacks by Russia's Putin against Ukraine and its people. Photographs are sometimes placed in albums and scrapbooks to tell the larger story of someone's experience and life. The order in which photographs are placed is often equally important, as are the inscriptions that accompany the prints. And then there is the archive, which is the collection of historical documents or records providing information about a place, institution, or group of people. And archives are the important organizations or departments within larger institutions that help to bring order to all of these images. Archivists have the enormous task of filling in gaps of information and making the images and the information they hold accessible to researchers. Archivists themselves are a wealth of information and magic guides to help researchers find the information they are looking for and more. With the advent of the internet, photographs can be scanned, studied and shared widely. And these are just three of several collections that I accessed for this presentation. Although I was just saying to Arto before we started today um, that it's a, it's a little uh, odd to be talking about the importance of physical photographs um, through Zoom. And I, I do hope uh, that we'll have an opportunity to show some of these physical prints um, to a broader audience soon. In this, in this presentation, I have not really touched on the place that photographs hold in the art world. However, it is particularly interesting to me how archives of images are being used by artists to create installation art. On the left is a 2009 work by Penelope Umbrico of sunsets taken from social media's Flickr to create a mural for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. On the right is a powerful installation by Carmen Winnen composed of over 2000 found images of women preparing for and in the process of labor and childbirth that was shown at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City in 2018. In both of these examples, it is not the singular print that is used to make a statement, but rather a large body of images on the same subject. Through this presentation, I have discussed the, the variety found in photographic materials and some examples of where, when, and why we take photographs. I know that Arto will be sharing with me some questions from you all, but I would like to conclude by inviting you to share thoughts or memories that may have come up during this presentation, either in the chat or on Project Saves YouTube channel where a recording of this presentation will be made available. The power of images, like some of the ones we have seen this evening, is that they can make us think about our own lives and reflect upon our own experiences in our families, friends, and communities. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tatiana. That was that was wonderful. Um, uh, as as Tatiana mentioned, feel free to uh, add your questions in the in the chat, and we will uh, filter them uh, to her. Um, and uh, in the meantime, <clears throat> Tatiana I was. There's a bunch of things that that kind of uh, came to mind. I, I think for me, one of the um, biggest questions for me has been uh, these six months or so, uh, having joined Project Saved. How would you? How do you reconcile? How do you, as a conservator, as someone who? has spent so much of her life uh, with with images and uh, archives um, and, and thinking about the scope and history of photography. What what how do you reconcile this the incredible shift just in the last 10, 20 years where you know we've gone from uh, for the photograph as such a unique and special object, material object, uh, like so many of the ones that you shared, um, not easily uh, reproducible, you know, something that, as you showed, you know, they're tattered, they're folded, people would carry them around in their wallets. How do you, or, or show them in their homes? You know, I was thinking about that. I, I, when I go to people's homes these days, unless they're a, of a certain generation, I don't know that I see a lot of personal photos anymore hanging on people's walls. How do, how do you reconcile or think about this incredible seismic shift from the kind of materiality to not just the digital uh, photography, but the kind of sensory overload where anybody with a phone can take a million photos every day. We can upload them all over the place on the internet. Um, we bombard others with images, we're bombarded with images and it just becomes this incredible, we're just awash in, in images. Does that, what do you make of all yeah. that in terms of where we are in the history of kind of the image? Thank you for asking that question. Uh, I wanted to include in my presentation that um, it's important that we do our own editing. We take so many pictures and even, you know, in a day I might take 10 pictures of my son and they're probably a second, you know, uh, from each other. So mm -hmm. I can go in and choose maybe one um, that I like and get rid of the rest. Um, or star it. And then a good practice is to continue printing. Uh, there are so many companies out there. You can uh, get a book made or a calendar. You know, it's not the best material usually, uh, but it is a physical object that if for any reason your hard drive crashes or you lose your phone and you haven't uh, uploaded your images or backed up your images, you still have something. Um, that said, things are also changing. And so <clears throat> I think that brings up the, 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 the point that historians and curators and archives are extremely important mm -hmm. um, to help take all that information and do something with it. Or even having residencies where you have artists that come um, and they take that information and they do something with it and in a way that's like printing it. Uh, yes. it. It's developing it further. And it's also using that information to say something about uh, the collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think there's something to be said. I, I think you use the word to, to edit, kind of uh, editing kind of. And I, yeah, that's kind of what I've, it, it, because I think, you know, um, it, this is kind of across all, all, all artistic and communication spheres these days, right? I mean, when we think about music, when we think about uh, this whole, no well, to me it's nonsense, but what do I know? I, this thing about NFTs and, um, you know, in terms of <laughs> the change in, you know, the, the way that it's not just photography, but but I think the, the historic shift that the internet has unleashed, good and bad, 
I think it is about now the, the onus is on the individual uh, or on groups of, of, you know, some collective to be able to sift through and discern what's what and, and how to contextualize and how to provide some kind of cohesiveness uh, that tells the story of who we are and, and where, you know, where we were and where we're headed and so forth. Otherwise, I, I, it seems to me that um, we're in this like this tenuous place where it's just um, because in some ways it's almost like um, it, it's almost like why is photography even important? Do you know what I mean? I mean if it's I, just I, I, I we become oversaturated and then we stop seeing even though we're taking taking and consuming images all the time. Yeah, yeah, and in yeah. a way it's almost like the same thing in the in the music industry, the same thing with filmmaking. Uh, the same thing. I mean, when you have a million platforms that are uh, uh, bombarding us with content, and and especially with photography, where as I said, it's just so easy to constantly be snapping pictures, and it, it's um, on the one hand, it, it does what's happened with music, with filmmaking, other things. On the one hand, it democratizes it and it elevates, it opens it up to everyone. Um, on the other hand, I think that what you say about editing. And um, I think connected to that, that's, and I think that's where archives become so important. Some sense of understanding, like what is an image? <laughs> you know, like what is a right. photograph? It's, there's, there's such rudimentary questions, but I think um, when, when it, at this point in the 21st century, it's as if, even though it wasn't that long ago, it's as if we're already somehow that umbilical cord is being cut to like, yeah, what's even the value of some family photo from 1982 or something like that. Um, right. and, 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 and you see and that I, if you go to like a, um, a, a thrift store or an antique shop, you'll see boxes of photographs that have no name on them. And that's another thing that I, I advise people to do when people pass away or be, before people pass away, actually it's better to, uh, try to catch that person and show them in images, get the names of those people written on the back. Yes. Um, yeah, and in that way, you know, um, with Project Save, you know, um, we're very fortunate. Um, you know, Ruth, our founder, Ruth Tomasian, she's been such a pioneer, um, not just in the Armenian world, but just in the world of, of collecting and archiving and photography. She has, an unbelievable re detailed record of m a lot of what we have. And, and you know, that's well over 60,000 uh, photographs. She oftentimes has notebook after notebook of documentation, cassette tapes of oral histories. Uh, I mean, so, um, um, and that, that I think is, that I think has laid such a foundation for Project Save to now be able to kind of bring all of that to life a lot more. We're very lucky that we have all of that kind of scaffolding, all of that foundation is laid. Yeah, um, certainly, it, yeah. this, this, this kind of relates to a question, um, um, uh, there's a question, as a conservator, how do you know what folds or lines can be removed, I guess, from an image versus what value in the object's history? Like, how, how do you kind of decide what hmm. to tinker with in terms of? Yes, that is a constant challenge, actually. Whenever we receive something that has signs of damage, Mm -hmm. determining how far do we take a treatment. And oftentimes, to answer your question directly, it, it depends on what the intention of that photograph initially was. Mm -hmm. So if it was a photograph by Irving Penn that was made for the art market and it, it should be pristine so that when you look at it, you only see the image. Mm -hmm. That is different from a family photograph that they show folds and they're not distracting to the eye. You still can see the image. Um, and so, yeah, let's say you do have a family photograph that has incredible, you know, really deep folds and um, they are signs that the photograph was kept or, you know, kept close to the body, folded up, for example. You don't want to get rid of that completely. And actually you can't, uh, the realistically treating a photograph and the folds 
um, those types of folds, you can help to reinforce the photograph and help to make it so your eye isn't fully distracted by those lines when you see it, but you're never gonna get rid of them completely. And then also another aspect of what conservators do as opposed to a restorer is that we document everything. We take photographs before and after treatment. We write reports saying what we see initially and then also what we do. Um, so that's a huge component of what, what our role is. Mm -hmm. um, sort of related to that, um, a question from um, Margaret, um, how do you preserve she asks, how do you preserve the family history using, um, you know, when there's these shoe boxes full of photos, let's say, that families have? She's asking, how does one categorize the images, the names, the places? Is there a particular system that you recommend? That kind of labeling, I think I would, I would uh, ask an archivist um, for the proper method. But <clears throat> what I often do if someone passes away or if someone is trying to work through their own archive and get it in order is to first prioritize. So go through, because sometimes it's just overwhelming the amount of photographs that we accumulate. And those are physical photographs. I mean, think about the digital photographs we're taking these days. But anyway, so it's often overwhelming to, to deal with the physical photographs that our families have accumulated over the years. So going through them, prioritizing, and then taking that smaller group and start um, <clears throat> providing safe housing for them, maybe scan a few uh, if you can't do more. Um, and then if there are any that are really special that you wanna commit money uh, to having treated if they need treatment, then you can do that. Um, but, yeah. but prioritizing is, is key. Right. Yeah. And, and to follow up with that, I would say, because I'm noticing here, there are a number of questions in, in the ballpark of, you know, how should I go about documenting the photos I have? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I would say that, you know, you should contact Project Save. Um, let us know so that our, as, as Tatiana mentioned, you know, the, the archiv our archivists will be able to uh, assist you in much more of a detailed methodological, methodic way um, as to how to proceed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very important, I think I should mention here, and I'm sure Tatiana would agree, don't, 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 um, I think one thing that people, which is a normal thing to do, they go through all these photos and they think, well, you know, Project Save doesn't want these or the Athenaeum doesn't want these, or this museum doesn't want these. We want them all. You know, we, our archivists, our conservators, uh, we, we want to at least see what it is that you have. And we'll, we'll work with you to, to kind of prioritize and figure out what, you know, how to proceed. So I, I would say just contact, you know, contact us, contact Project Save, contact, whatever organization you're thinking about working with, but let, let them know so that you can have some professional guidance and, and you know, um, we're, we're more than excited to, to help out. Um, there's a question from uh, Ara Oshagan, who uh, is actually gonna be one of our speakers in this series, hopefully <laughs> sometime later in the spring. Um, he's, he's a photographer and artist in California. Um, and uh, he's asking about the composite photos. And actually, I, I had made some notes about that too. They're so fascinating. Um, he says, the composite photos you showed are truly fascinating. They take photos from several pasts and imagine a future by the very process of com combination and bringing them together. It seems to me it's a creative endeavor. Could you speak a bit more regarding the motivations behind some of these types of photos? And that, that's what struck me as well. There's something creative going on there. There's also something about the question of, I mean, photographs are supposed to capture reality. And yet these photos are, you know, what's so, you know, what they're problematizing reality, obviously, by combining uh, more of a collage effect rather than a sp capturing a specific moment in, in time. They're capturing that moment of time, but then they're splice, they're disrupting it with a completely different moment in time. Um, and I think that raises all sorts of questions, um, uh, both, I think, um, in terms of they, they have a certain sublime beauty, uh, a kind of perhaps unintentional uh, sublime kind of just kind of eerie artistic beauty, 
while also kind of uh, raising a lot of questions about just the process of, of quote unquote reality, capturing reality. Yeah, I think um, it, there, what, what could you say? It's a ref I think it's in this case, I mean, it's a reflection of a of a, a, a group of people who who experienced genocide, trying to keep their family together um, in some form, trying to stay connected also not necessarily in this exam, not um, not only with the history of Armenians, but anyone that's immigrating, uh, trying to keep uh, family together. Um, and yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. I think with this archive, it's it's the first place that I have seen such a, a, a large example of these types of composite images. Um, and the motivations, I mean, like you saw um, sending images to another country to help a family member that's there, a member of their family that's back home um, or what was their home and trying to keep people together um, yeah. spiritually. What I find, yeah. so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Tanya. Just, it, you know, what, what I find uh, very moving about those images is that it's, especially uh, any group that's gone through a particular kind of personal and collective trauma, I mean, it, it's, they're literally trying to change reality. You know, right. they're, you know they're, they're trying to, you know, yes, they want to show, hey, this is me now as an adult or, you know, whatever, and put it in the photo. But there seems to be some very poignant, melancholy, just profound, um, in, almost instinctual thing going on there where right. they're literally trying to somehow dent or shape or kind of put a curve into the, the trajectory of, of their past and, and their present kind of to try to somehow alter something. Yeah, it, it, it shows this, this space of reflection too where people were trying to process what was happening. And it also makes me think of, of scrapbooks and, um, and albums where people are, are creating a world. Sometimes when you're looking through these scrapbooks, they are creating their own world filled with the things they wish for or would like to have happened or would not like to have happened. Sometimes you see images where people's faces have been scratched out for some reason, right. either um, someone passed away or there was, a, there was a feud, a family feud. They don't want that person there anymore. Um, right. So yeah, these are all just amazing examples. Kind of like the original versions of, you know, people these days who kind of, uh cut out pictures of their boyfriend or girlfriend or something right. they're on social media and things like that i mean and again i think that goes back to what you've been touching on is that the materiality of the photograph that it's an object and it's it's it is a living object it's not meant for some dusty bin in an archive or a library or a museum these are things that people um have been uh th there's almost a sensuous quality to it that people are constantly touching them holding them putting them in their pockets right. um, and as you say sometimes that relationship with that object is loving <laughs> sometimes it might be angry sometimes it could be very painful and so forth um by the way uh, we have here in the chat uh, Mar our, our head photo archivist marta fodor hi marta thank um, you marta <laughs> I, I didn't. I, sorry, I wanted to just thank them so much for their help on this. Yes, <laughs> both she yes. and Margaret. They're fantastic. Thank you, Marta and Margaret, so much. Um, the, the Marta's pointing out that one of the photos Tatiana shared. Um, it's in our database, and there's actually a video of Ruth uh, talking about that image. So there's a link there that Marta um, put that people can check out. Thanks, Marta, for that. Um, uh, Zena, hey Zena, um, uh, is asking. Where do you wish people would keep their images or not keep their images? So could you describe what warehousing an image is, please? Yes, so we're always conservators are trained to, to say, and it's true, to keep them in a place where you would wanna be. So not in your attic, not in your basement, um, in your bedroom, perhaps, uh, these plastic uh, Rubbermaid bins are wonderful because they protect the, the photographs from, 
you know, a water event of some kind. Um, so that would be the short answer, right. you know, with minimal resources. Yeah. And also I wanted to mention earlier too, that if you do go uh, labeling the backs of these photographs, you wanna be ideally using a pencil and you can draw or write along the edge. So you're not pressing, uh, creating an impression um, that goes to the front of the, of the photograph. Uh, if you yeah. create a label that goes with the photograph, it can get lost. Uh, so ideally it should be with it, you know? Yeah, yeah and I would say again, you know, it, if you're ever, you know, always be very gentle and careful with with what you're kind of adding to the to the actual physical object, you know, lightly in pencil, as Tatiana said. And in general, if you're ever unsure, again, the, the I think the important thing is to reach out to an organization like Project Save, reach out whatever organization where there are experts, archivists, uh, conservators, people that can guide you and give you the the proper um, tools and resources. Um, there's, I, I'm wondering if this is my one of my former students from the American University of Armenia, Diana Hazarian. I wonder. Uh, she says, thank you, Tatiana, for the fascinating print. I was amazed to see the photo of my hometown, Vanazor, Girovagan, in the presentation. It proves the idea that photographs can hide and instantly bring certain memories, feelings, even in an unexpected moment. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Um, and if it is you, I, I hope you're, you're doing well. It's been a few years. Um, I'm seeing us. There's a lot of good comments here. Uh, okay, there's a little archival code. So I was going to ask um, something else, Tatiana. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you said about, I think you said archivists are, are like magic guides. Yeah. Or remind me of that. I, I did. Really, yeah, I, I really, I really love that because, um, you know, I, uh, you know, my backgrounds in in music and in in in, uh, in poetry. My academic background is in is in literature, and uh, so I've been just in love with libraries and museums and archives for a very long time. Um, and now you know, I'm privileged and honored to get to be the director of one, um, such as Project Save. And I've always thought about them as kind of magical, mysterious places and the people that work there to be these kind of wizard types, as I think of Marta and Margaret uh, and Ruth at, at Project Save. Um, I, I was, so I was wondering, I, I want to kind of ask a more personal question to you. I mean, is that, is that something you, like that drew you to being a conservator? I mean, is that what drew you to kind of this world, to dedicating your life? Well, <clears throat> I think there are two answers there. First of all, I'm, I mean, I, I don't have an archivist's mind. And I think that when I work with archivists, they have a memory for the collection they're working with. So it's like an early Google, uh, when you can Google it or you can archivi archivist it, you know, you can ask them, generally what you're looking for, and then they come up with uh, wonderful content. Um, but what drew me to conservation um, is, is that these kinds of collections, uh, examples of our cultural heritage, these, these items are things that we go to um, in a time of difficulty, um, in a time of needing reflection and needing space to think, um, they provide us with, with that. Um, so I, I, I mean, I was brought up to think of art, uh, with the highest regard and, um, but I also were like working with my hands. I like to understand how, how things are made, how materials work together, um, how they don't work together. And so conservation, I have an undergraduate in science um, and my master's is in art conservation. So it was, a, it was a perfect mix of the two. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, 
and kind of related to that, um, I, I'm going to kind of, I think we should slowly wrap up. I'm going to take one last question. This is from uh, Greg Jundanian. Hey, Greg, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Uh, Greg's local here in the Boston area. Uh, can you speak to the challenge of bringing an archive to life, of the challenges of bringing the public in, a public that, that may not necessarily be obviously interested? I think it's a question for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Greg, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think first I would begin with a general answer, which is, you know, if you ask me, again, coming from the, a background in, in literature and music and academia, um, you know, culture in general is not exactly uh, high on people's lists these days. And I think um, we can get, that's a whole other topic, but I think, you know, that has a lot to do with just the corporatization of everything and, and the fact that people are so overwhelmed and overworked and stressed out and anxious and this and that and geopolitical things, economic, socioeconomic, everything combined. We're just not living in a time right now where culture is very valued. We're living in a time where the bottom line is valued. And, and the way we, we think about meaning and beauty and success uh, and uh, uh, things like that are, you know, if you ask me, they're, they're quite warped and kind of uh, to some extent even delusional. <laughs> but that being said, um, I, you know, I think the way to do it is to just um, everyone does what they can, right? And, and um, you know, uh, in our case, um, uh, you know, we are doing this kind of a, a series. Uh, that I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so um, happy with how this has gone, and I'm so grateful to Tatiana for this. Um, it, it's about kind of opening ourselves up, you know. Um, and I feel that at least, I, you know, I can speak from just Project Save's perspective. You know, our goal is that again, um, we are about photographs. Um, the photographs happen to uh, uh, reflect uh, Armenian heritage and culture and, and, the, and the global Armenian experience. But at the end of the day, they're photographs. And Project Save is an American nonprofit in Boston, Massachusetts, um, with a very diverse uh, staff. And so that by itself, once we think of it that way, that does open it up. Um, as we can see here, I mean, everyone that participate, a lot of people that participated in today's event, a lot of them, I, I don't know them from Project Save. They're not, they're, they're new people to Project Save. So I think um, a, a, a lot of that has to do with Tatiana's wonderful expertise and, and, um, and, and presentation and her background. Uh, a lot of it has to do with just, just us reaching out and saying, you know what, this is about photography and what could be a more universal language than photography. Um, I, I mean, it's so it's tough. Basically, what I'm saying is it's tough. So but but I think the way to do it is just to be out there, uh, try to think of different ways that 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 you can I know you're doing a project related to Whitensville at, near Worcester. Um, I think the way to do it is just to be out there in whatever way connecting to to schools or young people, older people, different types of organizations. Um, and just thinking of ways that you can kind of get your get the word out there. Having a really great uh, web presence uh, could could be something as well. Um, so I think there are a lot of different ways, but there's no one answer. There's no magic bullet. I mean, I think these days um, anything cultural related is definitely an uphill battle. So um, I think the comfort is that folks like us can have camaraderie and pool our energies and passions together and cheer each other on and support each other and go from there, you know? Um, I think maybe we'll stop there. I just wanted to thank Tatiana, thank you so much. Uh, Tatiana Cole is, has been our first speaker in our Conversations in Photography series. And, and um, uh, we're so grateful to you, Tatiana. And, and also thank you for being part of our... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, let, let everyone know some of the upcoming speakers. Um, on April 9th, um, uh, I'm trying to keep the speakers uh, diverse and, and uh, we're gonna go from the conservation side to the practitioner photography side. So Nazik Armenakian, who's a wonderful photographer based in Yerevan, Armenia. She is one of the head and founders of the four plus Photography Collective. She'll be our speaker on April 9th, and we'll, we'll share those details with you uh, coming up. 
then uh, we also have Elena Bulat, who joined us today. Thank you, Elena. Elena's at Harvard University. Um, she'll be uh, joining us as well. Uh, we have Stepan Shahinyan, a photographer in Brazil, who'll be one of our speakers. Kim Heckel, who's a photographer and artist based in New York City. And hopefully uh, Ara Oshagan, as I mentioned earlier, sometime later in the spring, who's based in Los Angeles. So there's a lot of great uh, uh, speakers uh, uh, lined up. We have other initiatives, as I mentioned, that we'll be sharing with you all. Um, feel free to check us out at projectsave.org. For any ways, any questions you might have, if you want to follow up on today's talk, please be in touch with us. And we'd be happy to uh, uh, touch base with you about your photographs, about your stories, and see what ways we can uh, be of assistance. Um, and uh, and if you feel like supporting us, of course, we're, we we very much appreciate that. Uh, nonprofits like like Project Save um, uh, and other nonprofits they they oftentimes depend on wonderful people like yourself. So we thank you all very very much for joining us. And also go visit the Boston Athenaeum as well, which is an, a wonderful institution. Uh, and those of you that are around New England, uh, it's a wonderful institution uh, near the State House. So thank you all again very very much. Uh, we hope to see you next time, April 9th. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.